Hey there team, chemistry coach coming at you. You ready for video number seven in our atom and atomic theory journey? We're getting to the end here, getting to one of the key, most important concepts in chemistry. The mole, the bane to most introductory uh, chemistry students' existences. <laughs> it's uh, the first time you run into this concept, just like, what, my brain? But once you get used to it, it's one of the key calculations you'll do all the time. It's it's kind of like a when you're flying all over the country, there's this, you know, you, you always kind of got to go to a hub city and then take another flight to another city, those kinds of things. It's hard to get direct flights to kind of smaller places. So you go to a hub center. The mole is like the hub in chemistry. You, in a lot of your calculations, you got to get to the mole before you can get to something else. Right? It's hard to get to one place in chemistry in a calculation at one step. So what is this mole concept that just, you know, has this gets this bad rap for people who've never taken chemistry before? Well, imagine the issue of being a chemist and being forced to count things. You know, when we count things, you know, I can I can count cats, right? I've got one cat, two cats, three cats, four cats, right? I can I add up to six cats once and down to four now. So I can I can count those pretty easily. I can pull out you know the 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 bills in my wallet. Not that many. I got four kids, and I can count those out pretty readily. Readily be you know fairly confident that I did it correctly. But what if you're counting large numbers of distinct objects? That becomes a huge issue. For example, let's say I had twenty two trillion dollars in my wallet. This would be nice, right? <laughs> Wouldn't fit, but. You know, that's, I don't know what the national debt is for the United States now, but I know it's over 20 trillion. Most people will have a hard time conceiving of that idea. Would you agree it would not be efficient to count that $1 at a time? $1, $2, $3, $4, try to get to 22 trillion. How long would that take? Well, you could actually do the calculation if you wanted to. Just take 22 trillion. What's that? 22 times 10 to the 12th? In a trillion to the 12th, billion to the 10 to the 9th. Yeah, so take 22 trillion times 10 to the 12th on your calculator. Count them out one bill per second, right? So that would be 22 trillion seconds to count out 22 trillion dollars, one dollar at a time. Convert seconds to minutes, right? Uh, minutes to hours, hours to days, days to years. You know, say 365, you know, give or take a leap year issue in there. And look at how many years that is. If you do that, it's a lot of years. I converted that to centuries, all right? So I got around 7,000 centuries. That's about how long it would take you to count out 20. No, no, don't step by my Google little kitties, my little kitty. Why do they always <laughs> right where you need to go? Oh my gosh, you gotta love them. I was worried he was going to hit my stop or delete button. I'm like, no! At least this one here is sleeping. So do you, would you agree that's not efficient? 7,000 centuries counting $1 per second. That's $22 trillion. <laughs> it's just not going to work out. It's, it's inconceivable. Well, the same concept on a smaller scale is uh, when I was uh, younger, I used to go to, uh, oh, I forget where it was, somewhere in Irvine, and I'd go see a movie. You know, when I was in grad school, I just worked my brains out 100 plus hours a week. And then, you know, about once a month, I'd be like, oh, man, I, 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 I have to, like, leave this lab. And I'd head down to go see a movie. There's a little candy store right next to the movie theater. And I'd go in there to get uh, either a jawbreaker, a giant gummy, like, boa constrictor, or jelly bellies. I like jelly bellies a lot. Well, I'd go and scoop some jelly bellies out, right, and put them in a bag and bring them up to the counter. It's like a couple minutes to the movie. I'm like, okay. And, you know, was the person working there? Did they take my bag of jelly bellies and go, one jelly belly, two jelly bellies, three jelly bellies? Did they sit there for the next 20 minutes counting them? No way! They stuck it on a balance and said, oh, you know, $2.98. So they counted by weighing. They counted a more efficient way. As long as they had the average mass of a jelly belly, right? You could take the mass of the jelly belly, use the mass, average mass of a jelly belly, grams per jelly belly, and you could actually get the number of jelly bells estimated in there. So there's more than one way to count. And we need to do that in chemistry. Because imagine, that's counting by weighing. Imagine if we had to count atoms, ions, or molecules. 
right? Say, hey, you know, take a, you know, go get uh, five grams of lead and count out the number of atoms in lead one at a time. One is physically impossible. <laughs> go, oh, I got that atom, right? And there's so many atoms in there, it, it would be like trying to count $22 trillion one at a time, but exponentially more difficult. You could not live, and everyone who bears your name for the rest of the human history wouldn't have enough time to count those number of atoms. So you can get the absurdity of that, of counting things directly. So we can't count them directly. We're going to count them a different way, a more efficient way. And that's where the mole concept comes into play. It's absolutely necessary. So let me pause it, put up a new board. Let's introduce this mole concept. And uh, hopefully you'll appreciate it as much as I do. All right. So we know counting directly is impossible in chemistry. It actually is. So we're going to go, and it's a, this is a concept you already do, right? If you ever, um, like on Valentine's Day, I used to go, uh, when I was uh, single, I would go buy a dozen or two dozen uh, long stem red roses. And I would just hand them out to people, right? You know, just like, here you go, happy Valentine's Day. I'd be like, oh, I'll just brighten people's day. Now they all go to my wife and my kids. <laughs> all right. So I leave all my all my kids, you know, they'll wake up and there's roses all over the bed. My wife wakes up, there's roses all over the bed. It's just fun to do. It's fun to do things to people when they're sleeping. I do that for St. Patrick's Day too. The lucky leprechaun comes in and my kids wake up and they're covered in pennies. <laughs> just shing pennies in their ear and their pants. This is awesome. They wake up, oh, the leprechaun was here. Got to have fun in life, right? I got a cat hair in my eyeball. So when I'm, so a dozen, that concept of a dozen, or you go buy a dozen eggs. Well, what is a dozen? It's 12. Well, 12 what? 12 anything. I could have a dozen cat hairs in my eye. I could have a dozen cats. I could have a dozen kids. That'd be pretty expensive, right? But you could have a, you could apply it to anything. It's a unitless thing. It just represents a number. Well, a dozen atoms wouldn't make sense, right? But in chemistry, a chemist's dozen is a mole, right? It's all, don't freak out. It's just a number. One mole, we call it Avogadro's number, is like a dozen or a score, which is 20, right? Four score and 20 years ago. Well, four score would be four times 20 is 80. Four score and seven is 87 years ago, says President Abraham Lincoln, right? So this number is defined as the number of carbon atoms. If we took exactly 12 grams of pure carbon 12, right? Just that one isotope of carbon. The number of carbon atoms in it would be this number, all right? It actually can be measured. You could measure a single atom. So it's not an exact number, but it's got so many uh, significant digits, it's not important. And that's more than we need. But 6.02214179 times 10 to the 23rd is a huge, huge number. Oh my gosh, it's, it's inconceivable. And then when we put that with units in chemistry, and we're talking about molecules and atoms, we call it Avogadro's constant, which I will provide for you, but you'll have it memorized. And we don't need to use all those digits. Normally, four significant digits, so we're going to truncate it. If you need more, you can add more as necessary. But for this class, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is perfectly fine. That will be particles per mole. Right? So if I have one mole of those particles, there'd be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So we can use that as a conversion factor to go between number of particles and moles. And those particles for chemistry would be atoms, ions, molecules. You know, uh, we could do subatomic particles. We could have a mole of electrons. Later on, we're going to talk about a mole of photons, particles of light. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a conversion factor. Use as a conversion factor. And remember conversion factors, right? You know, the 1,000 grams per kilogram, 2.54 centimeters per inch. It just relates two different things together. So we can take an inconceivably huge number of particles, convert that to moles, that's our hub, and then we can go to grams or something from there. So it's a conversion factor between number of particles, we'll do some examples, and moles. So if you're given a number of moles, you could actually calculate how many particles are in that. Whatever the particles is, it doesn't matter. If you're given a number of particles, you can convert that to moles. Fairly simple. We'll do some examples. Um, huge number. That's why, like, for Father's Day, which is tomorrow, I usually get these t-shirts. One of my favorites. Our dad is one in a million. 
Not one in a million. I'm one in a million. One in a million is one times 10 to the 6th. I'm one in 6.022.14.179 times 10 to the 23rd. There has never been that many humans on the planet. <laughs> yeah. So you got to, and then they put all their little, oh, so many kids. I had to stop at four. There's no more room on the back of my shirt. It's, I remember when I applied for my first teaching job ever, right, to, to be a part-time instructor. I was part-time for four years before I was able to get a full-time position like an apprenticeship almost. And I remember the concept, I had to go do, do a 10 minute talk to the whole faculty. Man, you so, I've never taught before. And here's the, the, these seasoned professors. I'm like, I'm gonna puke all over. And the concept was the mole. I'm like, oh, snooze fast. How am I gonna cover this for a, you know 10 minutes? So what I did, I like money. So I proposed to them to start it out. I go, I talked about the mole. I go, well, how high would a mole of dollar bills be? I was hoping they'd never thought about that, and I got lucky because they didn't. You always want to get that, oh, you get that catch in that first minute in an interview. What makes you different than the other hundred people or whatever? So I actually did the calculation. I measured. It was. I took a ruler, and it was about ten dollar bills was about a millimeter high. And so I just took that many dollar bills, right, divided by ten uh, to get to millimeters, converted millimeters to centimeters, centimeters to inches, inches to feet, feet right, to miles, just to see how many, how high, and, it, and, and I asked them, and they're like, well, I was like, how high, and one of them was like, as tall as the Empire State Building, another one was the moon, you know, they were kind of goofing around, and they weren't even close, they thought they were being cuckoo, to the sun, <laughs> not even close, do the calculation, you'll get an answer in the range of about 10 to the 16th miles, uh, so I got the answer, I was like, one molar dollar bills, ten dollar bills per millimeter is about it was like four, three or four times 10 to the 16th miles. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. What does 10 to the 16th miles mean? So I was looking up at like astronomical distances and it was like past Alpha Centauri out to the center of the Milky Way galaxy somewhere. It was, it was an inconceivably huge stack of money. And, and when I said that to him, I was like, you guys aren't even close, right? <laughs> None of the professors there were even remotely close and they were goofing with the sun. I'm like, not even close. And that was the hook that got me my first part-time gig, which led me to over 20 years of teaching. So you never know. Kind of fun to do that. So let's do a couple examples using this mole concept, going from moles to number of particles or number of particles to moles, just so you get a feel for it. Normally we won't do that in and of itself. We usually don't stop at moles. Usually we take, we go to moles and then go to something else, right? Grams or milliliters of mass or volume or something like that. So let's do some examples real quick. Pretty simple. These are, these are simple one-step problems. Like I said, we're usually going to do this in context of a unit line equation. This will just be one step in the unit line equation, but I want you to get comfortable with getting to moles and out of moles from number of particles. So here, how many molecules of sulfur hexafluoride, remember nomenclature for covalent compounds, not monosulfur, sulfur hexafluoride, are in 0 0.214 moles. No kitty! <laughs> Uh, 0 0.214 moles of SF6. And we could have done molecules, atoms, or ions. It wouldn't matter. The problem's the same. So the, the substance we're talking about is irrelevant at this point, right? When we get to grams later, that will be. All right. Well, let's think about what we're doing here. Uh, we're solving for molecules, starting with moles. So we got to go from moles of sulfur hexafluoride to number of molecules. Now, the abbreviation for mole, M-O-L-E, is just M-O-L, right? Not M, that'd be meters. Molecules, you can go M-O-L-E-C if you want to. So for M-O-L for moles, M-O-L-E-C for molecules. Let's set this equation up pretty simple. So uh, start with our moles. So 0 0.214 moles of SF6. Now we're going to use Avogadro's constant. Yeah, most people say Avogadro's number, Avogadro's constant, and the same thing. Cat hair, uh, but technically, I guess Avogadro's number is just the number without the units. Avogadro's constant is molecules per mole, or atoms per mole, or ions per mole, or electrons per mole, whatever it is. So moles goes on the bottom, and the number's on the top. So 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of SF6 per mole of SF6. That's all it is, right? So how do you know if you multiply or divide? Just look at, you look at the units. It's just a unit line equation like we've done before. 
So I just need moles to cancel out. And I'm left with molecule. Yeah, not too bad. I could actually go to like number of atoms, right? So there'd be like uh, six fluorine atoms per one molecule. So I could have extended this if I wanted to. Um, again, this is not an exact number. We truncated it. Um, uh, you know, four sig figs is good enough because we only got three here. That's perfectly fine. So let's take 0 0.214 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And you could do more digits. You could go 6.022 and, you know, keep adding it. It's not going to make a difference to your answer. Uh, limited to three sig figs here because that, uh, you know, leading zero is not significant. So three sig figs, we're going to get molecular. That wasn't a very good job crossing that out, was it? That was more like an underline there. And if you punch this number out, what do you get? I get 1.2887, 1 1.2887. 1 vertical dash line 87 because we got the three sig figs, right? Times 10 to the 23rd molecules of SF6. That is a very large number. All right, so it's an inconceivably huge number. Uh, and then that's going to round up to 1.29 times 10 to the 23rd. So 1.29 times 10 to the 23rd, I've run out of room, molecules of SF6. Not, I mean, it's actually very simple math. You just got to think of it like you would any other conversion. Let's do one more example. We'll call it a day for this video, but let's flip it. Instead of starting with moles and going to number of particles, let's take a number of particles, whether they're atoms, ions, or molecules, and convert that to moles. That is going to be very, very common for you to do. Be right back. All right, number, another simple one for you. How many moles of tin, and I could have done any element, it wouldn't have mattered, are in 325 billion atoms. So we've got 325 billion atoms of tin. How many moles of tin would that be? Simple one-step problem, but it's backwards from what we did before. So we're taking atoms of tin and converting that to moles of tin using Avogadro's constant as a conversion factor. And you can say Avogadro's constant and Avogadro's mole. We'll use those interchangeably, even though technically they're a little bit different. So here we go. We've got three. Now, instead of writing 325 billion, 1 billion is 10 to the ninth, correct? So let's go 325 times 10 to the ninth. Not really proper scientific notation, but it'll be easy just to slap that 10 to the ninth. It'd be better to go like 3.25 times 10 to the 11th. So let's go 325. Woo, that's ugly looking 325 times 10 to the ninth uh, atoms of 10. Right? Or you could go 3.25 times 10 to the 11, I think, if I did that correctly. Let's use Avogadro's number. We're going from number of particles to moles. Now, the number of particles is in the numerator here, so it has to go in the denominator this time. So we're going to divide by Avogadro's number. Last problem, we multiplied by. So let's go 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of 10. Why 10? It's just the first one that came to my mind per mole of 10. And again, the 6.022 is fine. You know, we only got three sig figs in here. 325 billion, I wouldn't count that as an exact number. Good luck trying to count out 325 billion. Don't think you'd make it exactly the same every time. Uh, so I, if you punch it out to three sig figs, I get 5.39 vertical dash line. Three sig figs, right? 5.39, 6, 8 times 10 to the minus... 13th moles of tin, and that's going to round up to 5.40 times 10 to the minus 13th moles, M-O-L, of tin. Yay! That's a really small number, right? That's a, that seems like a lot of atoms of tin. 325 billion? That's jump change in chemistry, guys. Jump change! So you'll see when we're in a lab or something like that, we like the mole quantity because it gives us just enough, like a mole of, of tin, right? If we had one mole of tin, it would just fit into polymer for hand. It'd be a workable amount. One mole of water. You could actually do this. Take one mole of water, convert that to number of, um, to, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how later, how to get to grams of water from that. And then you can use the density to go to milliliters. But one mole of water is about 18 milliliters. So I measured out you know, give or take 18 milliliters of water. They're pretty close, right? Doesn't have to be exact on this one. But this 
is about one mole of water. So that's a nice workable quantity in a chemistry laboratory environment. This is why chemists are so enamored by mole quantities. Yay! So let's now take this to the next logical step. We can get from particles, number of particles, atoms, ions, or molecules, to number of moles, but that's just the hub zone. We usually don't stay in moles. We want to get to something we can use in lab, like grams or milliliters. So let's take the next logical step and get from moles to grams. Ooh, counting by weighing, my friends.